Chapter 1 in the ER. The smell of burned rubber, fresh in the air, accompanied the shattered glass sprayed out on the street. The twisted metal of two vehicles, a trail of blood flowing from the smaller one. The accident happened rather quickly and was over just as fast. It involved an 18-wheeler and a black suburban car. The car had been crushed by the sheer weight of the 18-wheeler, which flipped over as it tried to stop. Sirens filled the air, approaching closer to the scene as the truck's driver climbed out of his cab, cut and bruised. Within minutes, two ambulances rounded the corner, followed by the local fire engine. One set of paramedics headed over to help the truck driver, while the second checked on the driver in the car. To their amazement, he still had a pulse, a strong one at that. One of the paramedics, checking on the car's driver, yelled over to the firefighters to get the jaws of life to free him from the wreckage. The two teams worked quickly and carefully, pulling his body free. Placing it on a stretcher, they loaded him into the closest ambulance. The truck driver was treated in the other for minor wounds and a possible concussion. The sirens of the ambulance resumed once more as they drove to the hospital. Scanning the barcode on his neck, they sent his past medical history ahead to the hospital. They tore his shirt off, connecting several electrodes to his body, monitoring his vitals. His heartbeat stayed strong, but one of his lungs had been punctured by several ribs. The trip to the ER was faster than some of their others. They unloaded his body, rolling it into the ER, his body flinching every now and again. The nurses ended up strapping him down to the table, preventing any further harm. The doctors worked quickly to stabilize his vital signs. His body lunged up from the table as four large wings exploded from his back. The wings relaxed, draping along the sides of the table, resting his body back down. Several nurses screamed in horror. Doctors stepped back as blood dripped down the feathers to the floor. No one in the room had ever seen this happen before. They stood back from him, against the walls, in both awe and horror, unsure of what to do next. One of the nurses lifted a trembling finger, pointing to a necklace he was wearing that started to glow. Its light grew brighter as the air of the room swirled around his body. The straps holding him were unbuckled by an unseen force as his body lifted up from the table. An alarm screeched as red lights came on flashing. It had taken that long for all of his information from the barcode to be read by the hospital's computers. The doctors and nurses quickly evacuated the room as the doors into it started locking. A gentleman in a black suit, wearing a white shirt, thin black tie, and sunglasses, walked up to the head surgeon. What did you see in there, doctor? Still bewildered by what he had seen take place, the doctor answered him absent-mindedly. I saw wings erupt from the man's back after he had been brought in from a car accident. Was there anyone else in the car with him? No, he was the only one. What was he in an accident with? An 18-wheeler. The driver said he suddenly lost control of it and tried to miss him. In your professional opinion, doctor, what were his chances of surviving something like that? He wasn't supposed to be alive after a hit like that, let alone have a strong pulse with only a couple broken ribs and a punctured lung. It's really a miracle that he did survive. Who is that man in there, and what's going on here? That man is an outlaw of sorts. We've been looking for him for some time now. That's all I can tell you, Doctor. The man in the black suit turned, walking toward a group of people which had arrived, all dressed similar to himself. The doctor called after him. But what is going on in there? I said, that's all I can tell you, doctor. 
The group of people quickly cleared the hall of the nurses and doctors, still gazing in disbelief into the room as the man's body remained in the air. With the hallway cleared and all security cameras turned off, the man in the black suit unlocked the doors into the room. Opening the doors, strong air currents spilled out into the hall as an old man in a dark blue robe walked through the hall into the room. He held an aged black leather book with red writing on the cover in his arms. The currents caused his robe to thrash about with great force as he took out a metal disc with unusual carvings on it. Holding the disc up level to the man's body, the wind became still once more, and his body rested down on the table. The necklace's glow died as several people in black suits rushed in, all with guns drawn. The old man, stepping closer, looked down upon him. A look of content on his face spoke in a cold, raspy voice. Get up, fool. You've lost. Each gun cocked, ready to fire if needed. It's no use trying any of your tricks to escape. I have the sacred metal of Nero. For the first time since being brought in, the man on the table opened his eyes and replied in a cheerful tone to the old man. Oh darn, I was doing so well too. It's a real shame that the only celebrant they could find that knew of it and could use it against me won't live to tell the tale about how you defeated a great phoenix with his knowledge of the primeval ways. A small smirk graced his face. What foolishness do you speak of? You are powerless, so long as I have this. Even good old lead can kill Ah, uh, but we have noticed, human, is that since you came in here, my blood covers most of the floor. And now your robe too. It is only blood, useless to you without your powers. Oh really? Well if I remember correctly, I'm sure I do, my blood is rather flammable. And I really do love these lighters that they still produce in this time of technological dominance. Phoenix withdrew a small metal lighter from his pocket, flipping it open as a look of worry took hold of the gun wielders throughout the room. The leading man in black yelled forcefully to the others, showing no fear of his own, of Phoenix's underlying threat. Stay where you are. He's bluffing. Am I, Frank? Do you think I'm bluffing here? I'm practically bleeding to death without my ability to heal, thus spreading more of my blood. All I have to do is drop this lighter into it, and everyone becomes a memory. It won't matter for me. As soon as that artifact falls into the fire, I'll walk right out of here as if nothing happened. I'm sure you don't want that to happen. Now with all I know about your society. For what if the masses knew what I do? It wouldn't last very long now, would it? Agent Frank's face boiled with rage, fighting to find words to reply back with as a long pause took place between the two. Then, quite suddenly, a calm look swept over his face. Agent Frank grinned, knowing what to say. You wouldn't allow a fire of that sort to take place in a hospital where hundreds of innocent lives would die. That would ruin any chance you may have for redemption. Even if you think the fire will only stay where the blood is, you forget that the building has miles of piping containers oxygen running through it. Clever Frank, very clever of you. I feel all warm and fuzzy inside, knowing you want me to be redeemed in your society's eyes once more. However, you should know something very important. Oh really? What's that? I shall rise again on my own accord as your society falls in upon itself from its own lack of acceptance. You think they don't accept others? Well, do you? After all they accepted you back and you didn't even know your own name. It was by your own fault that you are what you are. Three accounts of murder and the fourth kinds are acceptable in any culture. A lot of double talk there, Agent Frank. 
They accepted two accounts of murder before my own actions. They even held up the murderers as heroes for their actions. And I, in no shape, form, or fashion, see murder of any type as an action to where the murderers should be seen as heroes. With that, he dropped the lighter into the blood, instantly engulfing the room in flames. Just as he predicted, the artifact fell into the fire. Walking out of the room, his wings folded into his back once more. The fire twisting and swirling around his body, forming a new black silk shirt, replacing the one they tore off. On his way out of the room, he turned on the sprinklers. The alarm sounded again, this time for the fire. His bangs fell loose on his face as the water dampened his hair. Calmly, he opened the doors, releasing clouds of smoke into the air, placing a pair of sunglasses on as he rounded the corner. Several fire trucks pulled up to the hospital as Agent Frank ran outside, barely a mark on him. He looked around for Phoenix. Frustrated, he took out his cell phone, dialing a number on it. Yes, sir, he got away again. Yes, sir, we had the artifact with us. No, sir, the old man didn't survive. No, sir, neither did his book. I'm sorry, sir. We tried all we could, but... Yes, sir. I understand we will catch him. Very good, sir. Finished with his call, he walked to the curb where a black limo pulled up. The driver opened the door for him where a shadowy figure waited inside. The firefighters fought the flames as the limo drove off.